Very good evening, dear viewers. You are joining us with Blood Red Alia, brought to you by the Road Track Club of Colombo East. I know many viewers have been asking us why we named it Blood Red Alia. Don't worry, your curiosities will be relieved in a couple of minutes when our question and answer session begins. Um, why did the Road Track Club of Colombo East choose this topic of conversation during this particular time? I know it is no, um, it is no new information to you, the things that have been happening around us. If you are an updated citizen who lives up to your responsibility as a global, responsible global citizen, then you probably know the atrocities taking place in the Middle East. Um, so the Road Track Club of Colombo East, one of the premier road track clubs in the country, chartered in 1989 has built a reputation of finesse and articulated action as a youth-led social service and self-actualization platform par excellence. We chose this topic of conversation because we believe it is of timely importance that we as active youth who can take part in global problem solving must be informed about what exactly is happening and we must have clarity to obtain a stance regarding situations like this so that we can voice our concerns and make sure that peace and reconciliation spreads around the world. Without any further ado, uh, dear viewers, I will be going into introducing our three exceptional panelists who will be joining us to talk about the crisis taking place in the Middle East. All right. Um, first and foremost, Miss Yasmin uh, Rish Mawi. She was born and raised in Bethlehem, Palestine. She is currently an advanced master's student of cultural anthropology and development studies at KU Leuven, Belgium. She is a member of the steering committee of the Palestine Youth Ecumenical Movement. Uh, Yasmin has been actively engaged with the World Student Christian Federation since 2010. From 2012 to 2017, she was the coordinator of the, WSC, of the WSCF's Advocacy and Solidarity Committee. She currently sits at the Global Executive Committee of the WSCF representing the Middle East re region. Uh, Ms. Yasmin, if you could turn on your camera and show yourselves to our viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us this evening with Bloodred Alia. Um, our next panelist uh, taking part in this conversation this evening is Ms. Noor Bimbashi, uh, a young Palestinian activist hailing from Jerusalem. She graduated with a bachelor's in English language and literature, minoring in translation and business administration. She is currently reading for her MA in public advocacy and activism at the National University of Ireland, Galway. She advocates for the Palestinian rights to self-determination and independence and serves in several organizations that empower the youth in advocating for social equity, gender equality, and peace. Uh, she is renowned for a video that advocated for freedom. Noor sits on the board of directors of the YWCA Palestine and headed uh, the translation department at the Yazer Arafat Museum in Ramallah. Ms. Noor, if you can turn on your camera and show yourselves to our viewers. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening in conversation about the atrocity taking place in the Middle East. Our last but not least, um, a speaker who a lot of viewers were really excited about seeing this evening, uh, Mr. Nilantan Niruthan. Uh, please don't, uh, please don't think I'm doing this for humor. He made me say this. Is a not so young defense analyst. <laughs> His writings uh, revolves around global security, having covered issues like hybrid warfare, lethal drones, maritime piracy, human shields, and urban insurgency for various international publications. He also teaches low intensity warfare at the Defense Services Command and Staff College, the highest seat of military education in Sri Lanka. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening for a conversation about um, lots of chaotic things happening in the Middle East. Uh, before we commence, uh, I'd like to pose the first question to uh, Ms. Nirutan about uh, uh, the Alia uh, business, which is involved in the, the project title uh, of this project. Uh, so what is Alia? And theoretically, what are the consequences of Israel's immigration policies? This question is directed to you, Mr. Nilantan. Mr. Nirutan, sorry. Don't worry, they're both my name. So in, in, in terms of uh, what it is, I'll try to keep it short and simple. So it's the idea of the movement of the Jewish diaspora back to, I guess, what they would call the land of Israel. So Jerusalem, essentially. So it's one of the foundations of the idea of Zionism. So this whole 2000 year dream of the Israeli diaspora getting sort of uh, a home in the Holy Land again. That is so they call it making Aliyah. So going back to Jerusalem, uh, the Jewish diaspora emigrating back to Israel is essentially called uh, making Aliyah. In terms of the impact that this has, so 
globally the impact in terms of demographics is not really uh, it's not really significant right we're still talking about a small country and small numbers in terms of a global scale but geopolitically and culturally there's of course there are many uh, repercussions right so for example there's a jewish state and this in a sense problematizes many of the sort of the ways in which they deal with things so there will always be and i'm sure we'll get into that as we get into sort of some of the uh, deeper discussions the other thing is that what we've got to remember here in essence is the sort of the historical background that comes with it so even though zionism and making alia was a dream for 2000 years it was not until the holocaust in the second world war where that sort of almost became something that was going to happen so even if you look at many of these zionists from earlier time it was much more of a dream than some kind of impending plan whereas in the 20th century it became a much more tangible plan and i would argue that so western civilization and the geopolitical balance of power was premised on the notion of of cultural superiority right and the holocaust something like this the sort of the most brutal mass murdering sort of uh, genocide in modern history coming from the heartland of europe that also created a lot of european guilt which meant that after the second world war in terms of providing the jews with a place where something like this would never happen again the powers that be because they happen to be european and because the because of sorry, the brutality of the holocaust that made it possible the establishment of israel and whatever we will discuss i'm sure is a kind of to quickly go through a chronology of uh, what happened after israel was established or do you want to keep that for later uh we'll talk about that later because we have a question about understanding the background of the conflict okay. so we'll talk about that then okay so we'll move on to the rest of the conversation if you have more to say mr nathan i mean so it's so the major thing to remember if you're not familiar with the issue right is that uh, one population feels that their home was stolen and from their perspective they're right and another population feels that uh, they are being pushed into a corner where they don't have the right to exist so that seems to be the two primordial emotions on both sides the rest are nuances but i would argue that fundamentally this seems to be the kind of the existential aspect of the struggle thank you mr nandan that brings a lot of clarity to the situation at hand we're going to move on to the next bit of the conversation which is our 8 minute introduction uh, opportunity so i'm going to provide our three speakers with 8 minutes to establish their stances and their stand on the atrocity taking place in the middle east we'll start off with you ms yasmin this is your 8 minutes to present to us your stand when it comes to this issue Okay, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you um, for inviting for inviting me and for having us uh, here. And I'm really honored to be amongst all of you. Um, yeah, uh, as I as you already introduced me, Rishmaka, I'm Yasmin Rishmawi. I was born and raised in the city of Bethlehem. I'm a Palestinian Christian, and um, I can say that from uh, from my early age, I noticed the need for uh, voices that speak for justice. and peace in Palestine so i started uh, volunteering with um with local grassroots organizations uh the first was the joint advocacy initiative which is um the joint advocacy initiative with the ymca and ywca in palestine and um and but throughout the years i have to say that i struggled with my identity as a palestinian christian because uh my religion was and still being used as a threat to my existence as a palestinian in my own land and is used to legitimize and support political options and ideologies that are based on injustice so throughout a um, major part of my life my faith in god was challenged but in 2009 uh, uh the palestinian christians uh it launched the kairos palestine document which is a document that shaped our position as palestinian christians from uh from the occupation and its apartheid regime and um its effect on me was very empowering it helped me reconcile my christian and palestinian identities and it gave me uh, a deeper motive to challenge the unjust status quo and the uh, well the apartheid system uh, that's ongoing in palestine 
mine because it is my religion and my Bible that was being and is still being interpreted in ways that are bringing death and destruction to my land, to my people. So um, in 2010, I joined uh, two Christian social political movements, uh, namely the Palestine Youth Ecumenical Movement and the World Student um, Christian Federation. Um, the, we're in the Palestine Youth Ecumenical Movement, we are a gathering of Palestinian Christian youth and young professionals. Um, we also work under the umbrella of the YMCA and YWCA, and we work primarily to fulfill the Christian vision and to activate Palestinian Christian communities' national role and our, um, in our Palestinian society. To, we want to achieve peace with justice and we want to build a democratic pluralistic society that is dominated by the principles of social justice, respect for human rights and dignity. And so I can summarize our main goal as um, activating, amplifying the, vo the voices and strengthening the role of Palestinian Christian youth in our service for the church, our society and our Palestinian cause. Um, I would like also to mention that uh, the Palestinian Youth Ecumenical Movement, we are actively disseminating the Kairos Palestine document that I have just mentioned, and I can also share it with you. Uh, we're actively disseminating the document locally and internationally, and we also work on strengthening the Palestinian Christians' national role through commitment to our Christian teachings and Palestinian cause and identity. Um, and also in the World Student Christian Federation, where it connects, where it's actually the oldest international student organization, and it connects 2 million people over 90 countries all over the world. We are also putting our faith into action to contribute to the renewal of the ecumenical movement and to promote justice and peace in the world. Um, we hope to create a counter hegemonic narrative and to disseminate a prophetic voice at both local and international levels through our ecumenical diaconia and public advocacy. Um, um, I'm sure uh, as a Palestinian, my stance on Palestine does not need to be uh, put forward. I'm, uh, I will I'll be happy to discuss, lot, um, I will be happy to discuss whatever questions you have. And I think um, um, uh, let's short then eight minutes in introducing myself. Uh, thank you, Ms. Yasmin. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now for Ms. Noor to also present her stand uh, when it comes to the conflict in the Middle East. Thank you, Ritmaka. It is my pleasure to be uh, here right now, especially with everything that is happening right now in Palestine. I feel responsible more than ever to elevate uh, the voices of Palestinians and to be a representative of the Palestinian cause. My name is Noor Bin Bashi. I'm 27 years old. I was born in Jerusalem and I have been affected directly by the occupation since I was very young. I would start by narrating a very short story of the day I was born. I was born on a strike day and back then, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza would call for a strike on the 9th of every month to commemorate the anniversary of the first Intifada. Intifada in English means uprising, and the first uprising erupted when an Israeli army truck ran into a group of Palestinian workers murdering four. I was horrified of the idea that I held you for nine months. It, this is the sentence that is constantly repeated by my mom. Uh, almost every birthday. She, and thinking about it and with everything that is happening right now, I realized that even before I was born and before I came into this world, I passed through a checkpoint, Since it's especially because my parents planned to welcome their newborn baby in the holy city of Jerusalem. And I can say that this is only an introduction of my life, a story that I don't really remember, but it's constantly narrated to me by my parents. And I decided to take this opportunity to talk about Palestine because I've been recently traumatized by the Israeli occupation. As you said before that, um, I'm studying public advocacy and activism in Ireland. And uh, after one week of my arrival in Ireland, my father had a cardiac arrest in the street in, the street in Jerusalem, and he was immediately transferred into, the, into an Israeli hospital. And it's also important to refer that the healthcare system in Palestine and Israel is not equal and it's not uh, equally uh, good because Palestinians must have the Israeli in, uh, health insurance to receive medical treatment in Israeli hospitals. But unfortunately, um, I, we, didn't, we didn't have the health insurance back then. And the trauma all started when I decided to come back to, from Ireland to see my father. And 
hope that he would wake up from his coma. But, and, but unfortunately, I had to suffer every single day to pass two checkpoints to visit my sick father in the Israeli hospital. Unfortunately, after one week, um, I, was, I received a phone call from this Israeli hospital telling me that I, along with my family, must be present at the hospital. And it took us literally 20 minutes to convince the Israeli soldiers at the entrance of the hospital to let us in so we can bid farewell to my sick father. After my dad passed away and with all the trauma, especially because he was perfect, his health was really good, I had to present the death certificate to, my, uh, to the Israeli soldiers at the checkpoint while I was just trying to understand what is happening and how my father passed away. I was not allowed to enter uh, to Ramallah and see my family and grieve with them. So I, this is a story that I constantly share because I really want to be, uh, um, because my voice as a Palestinian is very important and my personal story has changed me and has changed uh, how I see things. I went back to Ireland and I saw a completely different world. I saw how people move freely. I see how people, uh, I see how happy people are, it's even in, a, in the midst of a pandemic, especially because we're all suffering uh, from a global pandemic, but I can see how comfortable people are in comparison to me as a Palestinian who is constantly struggling for my identity yeah. and for my life. Um, and I would like to ask if you could please present the short film that I have made because it summarizes my experience in Ireland as a Palestinian and occupied citizen. Thank you. Um, the technical team, could you share the video Ms. Noor uh, provided us? Thank you very much. Ask me about the meaning of freedom and I will tell you what I don't have. It's not just a meaning, but a feeling you carry wherever you are. I want to feel it, see it, maybe touch it, but it always seems too far. So here I am, carrying the burdens of oppression on my back, trying to convince myself that I have it, but I remind myself to keep my feet on the ground. It's a dream I am trying to reach. It's a reality, but not mine to seize. It's a right I cannot exercise. Everywhere I go, I imagine a checkpoint and soldiers blocking the road. I see beautiful views, but the upper tide wall is still where it is. I know for a fact that I can move freely anywhere I want except in my own country. But you have to know that the tribulations the occupation has caused do not define who I am because I will fight until I have what you have. I will resist until I know what freedom tastes like so I can carry it back to my Palestine, to my land, family and friends. I am here to take the world back with me to Palestine because the world knows us but should also see us. Thank you, Ms. Noor. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now for Mr. Nilantan uh, to present his and 
when it comes to the issues taking place in the Middle East? I mean, my stand is that it's a tragedy. Uh, if you have any specific questions, I would be happy to uh, answer it. But, uh, you know, in terms of crystallizing my position, that would be my crystallized position, that uh, it's a human tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Nantan. We're going to move on into the Q&A now. Uh, this question um, is to all our speakers. I'd like to open the floor of conversation uh, with Ms. Nilanta. Uh, according to your narrative, what is the origin of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what were the extenuations brought about, uh, the, what, are, what were the extenuations brought about the current state of affairs that we see today? Okay, so following on from what I was saying, so in 1948, we had the creation of the state of Israel, which was not backed either by the local Palestinian population or by the neighboring Arab nations. This resulted in a war between Israel and the Arab neighbors. And in sort of in, 50, in 1956, then Israel uh, squanders whatever goodwill it has by supporting the British and French uh, illegal invasion of the Suez Canal. And then that sort of ends up in a huge uh, trust deficit with its neighbors once again. In 1967, there's one more war. Once again, the surrounding Arab nations versus Israel. This time, Israel uh, sort of uh, beats them back pretty comprehensively. It also takes control of certain areas that belong to some of these neighbors. So the Gaza Strip belonged to Egypt. The, the West Bank belonged to Jordan. The Golan Heights belonged to Syria. So Israel ended up occupying many of these territories as what they call buffer zones. So Israel said, look, when we were created, all of you ganged up together and invaded us. Now, in 1967, you all ganged up and tried to invade us. So we need buffer states. So as in something in between for them to sort of make sure that they're. So that was the Israeli justification for what's called what the UN and the EU and all that call the occupied territories. Right. So fundamentally, though, we've got to once again go back to the historical nature of this. Jerusalem is a extremely important place for all three of the Abrahamic religions, the three great monotheisms, if you want to call it, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And that once again is also paralleled with the importance of that part on the world map geopolitically, because it's always been a conduit between the West and the East. So for, tra for economic reasons, for political reasons, cultural, religious reasons, this is always going to be contentious, right? So what, anyway, so in 1967, that happens. And uh, in 2005, where I would say the next kind of really major sort of uh, political development comes, the Palestinian leadership itself is officially split in 2005 into uh, Fatah and Hamas. And uh, in those territories, we've still not had uh, uh, elections, right? So those are the major things. And in the midst of all this, if we were to, let's say, critique the Israeli position, it would be what we would expect from a heavily militaristic state. So disproportionate attacks under the name of uh, preemptive strikes, targeting uh, civilian institutions and civilian targets. And their justification is that uh, Hamas uses civilian infrastructure and civilian locations from which to shoot rockets. Right. So in terms of the circumstances, this is the basic chronology of where we are at the moment. And we can get into the intricacies, the kind of uh, legal, military, strategic implications of it, I'm sure, as the questions come on. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Noor, if you'd like to answer the same question, according to your narrative, what is the origin of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what were the extenuations brought about the current state of affairs? So I'm going to start from the beginning and give, just give a brief uh, introduction that the Palestinian national identity is strong to us and it's, it's a source of pride and resilience. Um, but on the onset of the 20th century, the Zionist movement succeeded in imposing the concept of establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine on the international community. It, represented, it was represented by the League of Nations, which culminated with its endorsement of the British mandate, which incorporated the 1917 Belfer Declaration. And um, 
Jumping to uh, 1948, which is the Nakba, or in English, it's called the catastrophe. It, it happened when our national identity was overtaken and almost over half of the Palestinian people were uprooted from their lands and homes. Our people have been forcibly and cruelly deprived of their right to self-determination and national independence in the national state. Following the 1967 war, Israel occupied what remained of historic Palestine and immediately began colonizing the land, seeking to complete its annexation of Jerusalem and using the same means and tactics that it used in Palestine during the 1920s and the 1930s and also in the 1940s in what became Israel, only this time in grave violation of the international laws uh, developed post-World War II. Um, I think, uh, um, Yasmin, if you uh, want to add after the 1967 and how uh, Israel uprooted and uh, expelled uh, half of the Palestinian population and, in, and now they are called Palestine refugees and they are unable to return to their land because of Israel and Israel allows every single Jew to arrive at a Bengoyan airport and grant this Jew a passport that represents his nationality or religion or Israel. But unfortunately, to Palestinians, we are scattered groups all around the world because of the occupation and because of what happened in 1948, 1967. And I must refer to what is happening right now because it's adding a lot of, um, um, let's say, tragedies and expulsion and uh, confiscation of lands. Um, yeah, this is just a summary. Yasmin, if you, I forgot something, I'd appreciate if you mentioned it. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Yes, Yasmin, this opportunity is now yours to contribute to this topic. Um, yeah, what I want to make clear is to, to call things with their names right now. Um, Israel Zionist project is a colonial project and it did not start overnight. Uh, I can really go so much into uh, into historical background now if I have the time. Can I do that with Marco? Can I if go you, into if, more if you feel If you feel like it's important to bring up, yes, ma'am, we would. We would okay. Yeah, if I talk too much, just let me know. Okay. So, um, yeah, because because we can actually trace the history of Palestine to prim, prim, oh, sorry to primeval times, basically. Uh, when throughout history, Palestine was conquered and invaded and occupied by several colonizers and empires and armies. So there were the Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, the Persians, the Greeks and Romans, Byzantines and Arabs and Tartars. There were a lot of empires and lately there is Israel. So we need to know that Israel is only another empire colonizing Palestine right now with their Zionist project. Um, well, the, the process of creation of the Jewish nation in Palestine uh, uh, started in the late 1800s. Um, well, when European societies were becoming anti Semitic, and we had to uh, receive, we were at the receiving end of that basically indirectly. Um, when the first Zionist Congress took place in, in, in 1897, the, the idea of the Jewish state was born by Theodore Herzl, who was not. Uh, who, who was secular himself. And um, the Zionists realized from their early beginnings that they need the help of and the support of a, a vital, uh, the support of a, um, an imperial power basically. And that's, why, that's where the UK intervened with the Balfour Declaration where, where they uh, got uh, a promise from the UK to have to establish the, uh, the Jewish nation on Palestinian land with a complete disregard for the existence of the Palestinian people in their, in their land. And the Jewish immigration rate to Palestine started, um, started increasing since then. We're talking about a century ago. And uh, the people witnessing, uh, the Palestinian people witnessing more Jewish people arriving and taking over their land. The, lots of uprising happened in the 1930s and uh, lots of clashes, I would say. And this culminated with the end of the British mandate and the partition plan that took place on the 29th of November, 1947. And after the partition plan was approved by the UN basically, Israel started what we call the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. 
during 1947 and uh, the whole of 1948 and up until May 1949, Israeli troops and militias and later on the Israeli uh, Israeli army basically and systematically ethnically cleansed Palestinian villages where over 700 villages and uh, communities were wiped out of the map. And half of the Palestinian population, as Noor just, just mentioned, half of the Palestinian population became refugees, either internally displaced inside other parts of Palestine or other parts of the Middle East, in Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. And um, now they are still, even with the plight of Syria, Palestinian refugees are still, the uh, their plight is the longest, that's most protracted refugee issue throughout the world. Um, so, um, so that's why I want to highlight how important it is, the terminology we use when we describe what's happening in Palestine. I would not call it a conflict. It's a systematic ethnic cleansing process that's ongoing for over 70 years now. Um, it's an apartheid system where you can reach out now to the uh, latest the latest reports by Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem, which is an Israeli organization that mentioned and stressed what we have been saying as Palestinians for the past 70 years, that the current system Israel has on historical Palestine from the river to the sea is an apartheid system. And the Zionist project is a colonial project that is based on replacing the Palestinian population with Israeli Jewish, Jewish population. Um, so that's why we need really need to be careful with the terms because it's not a conflict. We do not have two nation states who both have armies and are fighting together. But we have a colonizer and a colonized, and these are not equal parts. So it's not a conflict. Sorry if I took too long. But. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Um, I'm not allowed to take sides when it comes to the conversation. So I'm going to continue to use the word conflict, but I will add slash ethnic cleansing as well um, to facilitate your request. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this question is directed at uh, Ms. Yasmin. Um, what is your first personal experience of the conflict and how, or slash ethnic cleansing, and how has that shaped your political ideology? Um, when you grow up with Makas, witnessing that your people are being persecuted for just being Palestinians, um you will notice very early that you have to take a stance you cannot be apathetic or you cannot stand still and watch your people being killed um i um i don't know which exactly was my first memory of well of the israeli occupation um uh, there were the checkpoints that we had to go through every time we moved around between palestinian cities or, 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 well, my father was in Israeli prisons in administrative detention for three years. And I think that was the most traumatic, um, traumatic event as a family that we had because being in administrative detention, I don't know if you are familiar with that term. Um, it's, you are, you are in Israeli prison and you are not allowed to know why you are there because the reason that you are in Israeli prison is a, a security threat. So you don't know why you are imprisoned. And the idea about administrative detention, it's, it's renewed indefinitely until unknown reason. So it's in renewed every six months, basically. So for six months, you will wait for my father to be out of prison, but then on the end of the six months, it will be renewed again and again and again. So you will never know when the cycle would end. So for three years, my father would be in administrative detention in Israeli prisons. And, and uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think it's obvious. Uh, I don't want to go deeper into my trauma, but I think it's obvious how that would affect the whole family. And on, on many level, on many levels. Um, and I want to keep it here. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Azim. Um, this next question is directed at Ms. Noor. Um, with your background in the Department of Antiquities in Ramallah, uh, what is the historic demographic of the region and how has that influenced uh, sentiment and the circumstances as they stand today? Well, I must mention that I've worked for five years at the Yasser Arafat Foundation, so this is exactly what I do. I work as a translator. 
So uh, my back background is mainly about translating political documents and translating the Palestinian narrative uh, to in, in English so that the, uh, the world can read and uh, educate themselves about the Palestinian narrative and the Palestinian cause. Um, regarding the democratic situation, I, um, if I want to start enumerating the policies, measures and actions taken by Israel and also perpetrated by Israel against the Palestinian people to seize their land and destroy their rights and national goals, especially in violation of the principles of international law and the principles of the United Nations Charter, or in breach uh, and grave uh, violation uh, of international human law and international human rights law. Um, so my background is mainly not with the Ministry of Antiquities, but it's I worked as uh, a translator and head of the communication department at the foundation. And I can say that um, I just want to refer to something Yasmin said, if I'm allowed. Yes, you are. Yes. You are. Yes, um, I just want to emphasize on what Yasmin said regarding the trauma of Palestinians, because I had the chance to, to narrate my story and how the occupation impacted me and the story of my father. But I have to mention something. I really appreciate all of the questions being addressed to us, but the situation right now and the current circumstances happening every single minute of our, of our daily lives, hearing the ambulance right now. And uh, prior to attending this panel, I watched uh, a video of a baby killed in Gaza by Israel, I just want to uh, highlight that and, and also appreciate what Yasmin is doing right now and also uh, give credit to every Palestinian or every person who is watching the panel right now because he or she wants to be educated on what's happening because what's happening right now is part of history and I will constantly refer to what is happening right now because this is exactly what I'm witnessing on a daily basis. This is my life right now, and this is Noor Bin Bashi. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Noor. Um, this next question is directed at all of you. Um, we'll open the floor with Ms. Nilantan. Um, how has the international community and the foreign policies of countries like the UK, US, and Arab League influenced the crisis. Um, Mr. Nilantan, you're on mute. Yeah, so, I mean, the current crisis, I wouldn't say they've, uh, they've influenced it, but their stance on it is quite interesting. And uh, the sort of stance of the international community in general, if we study it over the decades, has been quite uh, interesting as well. If you notice, the, the Arab countries have become increasingly reluctant to voice out against Israel the way they did earlier. And uh, in, in a sense, there's a, there almost seems to be a sense of the Palestinians being abandoned by the larger Arab community. Speaking to sort of members in those countries, they have their own sort of uh, grievances with uh, what the Palestinian leadership has done. So for example, if we go to the initial days, the country, countries like uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf nations, even Pakistan, were very heavily pro-Palestine. And one by one, they have all kind of had these incidents where they've become, they wanted to distance themselves from the Palestinian cause. So, for example, in 1970-71, there's a Black September where the Jordanian government gets uh, sort of uh, uh, fed up with uh, what they're doing because they feel that there's going to be an attempt to take over power. In uh, 1978 onwards, uh, Lebanon kind of gets a dissolution with the Palestinian cause because the Palestinian leadership there starts using Lebanon as a ground on which to attack Israel, which ends up in Israel invading Lebanon in 1978 and 1982. And even the Saudi and Gulf countries in 1991, the biggest blunder that the, the PLO did was uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, uh, the, the PLO was uh, one of the most sort of public uh, political actors to support Saddam Hussein's uh, annexation of Kuwait. So that totally alienated the uh, Saudi Arabian and uh, certain other Gulf countries because they were baffled. They were shocked. They were like, wow, 
So their entire political identity is that their land has been illegally occupied by Israel. And yet the moment their ally illegally occupies another country, here they are waving the flag. So that created a huge rift as well. And in 2005, when they got split between Fatah and Hamas, once again, there seems to be a split. Right now, as from what I can see, there are only three real allies of the Palestinian cause who are willing to actually help in terms of fighting the Israelis. Uh, Qatar, which is a very active uh, uh, supporter of the Palestinian cause, uh, you could say at least compared to the rest. And you have Turkey and Iran. Now, unfortunately, Turkey and Iran cannot help out on the arm front because they are themselves embroiled in a conflict with each other in Syria because Iran supports the Assad regime and Turkey supports many of the non-state militant actors there. So, for instance, whenever you see fighting like this exchange of rockets and Israeli retaliation and things like that in Gaza, you often see Hezbollah, which is a non-state uh, actor, uh, retaliating in some way, some kind of attack on Israel, at least to show their solidarity. That hasn't happened this time because Hezbollah is busy fighting on the Syrian front. So there are, as far as the international community is concerned, I think there's one problem where many, many people, and then Pakistan in the sort of uh, 70s was no longer on the Palestinian side either because when they tried to overthrow the King of Jordan, uh, it was the Pakistani army that was called in and General Ziaul Haq, who would later on become the leader of Pakistan because of a military coup against Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, Benazir Bhutto's father. So Zulfikar Ali Bhutto came all the way from Pakistan and he crushed that insurgency where he killed thousands and thousands of Palestinians. So on, on one side, we see them losing many of their political allies over the decades. And on the other side, you also have the total ambivalence of the rest of the international community, right? Uh, the international community is very good at shedding crocodile tears for the Palestinians. The international community is very good at uh, posturing, right? But in terms of actually helping people like my two co-panelists here, in terms of actually helping people who sort of uh, have an understanding on the ground, I don't really see the international community either interested right now in helping people like them, and even the people who were interested, the Palestinian leadership, because of its own short-sightedness, has completely alienated them. So. Uh, the Saudis, uh, the South, don't expect any help from the Saudis. Don't expect any help from uh, 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 Lebanon. Don't expect any help from Jordan. This entire thing is, uh, uh, like I was saying, a total tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Lankum. Uh, Ms. Yasmin, Ms. Nur, do you have anything to add to that question? How has the international community and foreign policies of countries like UK, US, and Arab League influenced the crisis? Do you have anything to say with regard to this question? Um, yeah, maybe I can highlight again the role of the UK in the formation of the State of Israel on the land of Palestine. As I said before, with the Balfour Declaration 1917, and also with easy with making it easy for Jewish people to be to immigrate to Palestine, which was under the British mandate. Um, but today, I can say that well, the UK, the US, and many European countries have a colonial history, and Israel is a colonial state. And I think with that, they share a lot of, um, well, they share a lot. And um, I, um, I'm sure that they cannot really point out the shortcomings or uh, not only shortcomings, they can point out the devastating results of, their colonial, of the colonial regime of Israel because they are a colonial, inherently colonial themselves. So that would also became, become a problem for, for them as well. And for, for us as Palestinian people, I think we feel completely abandoned by states and leader, world leaders. We are, uh, on the other hand, we feel supported by lots of people and populations around the world. As we have been seeing through the past days, all the demonstrations all around the world um, supporting the Palestinian people. Like in London, two days ago, there was over 100,000 people in protest um, for the cause of Palestine. So though we feel abandoned by the political leadership uh, all over the world and the international community itself, but we feel kind of supported by the people themselves. That's how I 
yeah, how I'm interpreting things these days. I don't know if Noor has got anything to add. Um, yeah, please. I would like to add that talking about governments, uh, we see the Palestinian situation and the Palestinian cause from a different perspective, but talking about people all, all around the world, they also impacted the Palestinian cause and elevating the voices of Palestinians and being in solidarity with the Palestinian people. So um, in, in my opinion, the international community is not doing um, the minimum of what it should do, to be honest, and to, um, to mention just uh, a few, uh, uh, to, to, to give evidence, uh, the international community must comprehensively confront and must use legal, political, and tactical means, and also must use the political and media arenas to communicate the real and full picture to the international community. Israel right now is violating most of the resolutions, most of the things that we constantly condemn Israel for. Israel is doing things that are against every single law in the world. It's against uh, the international humanitarian law, and it's, it's constantly violating UN resolutions, including 242, 181, and, even, and, and right now we must talk about the settler colonialism. Settlements, illegal settlements are illegal. And there's a resolution that talks about the illegal, illegality and uh, the grave violation of the, uh, the illegal settlements that are constantly expanding and being constructed in Jerusalem and outside Jerusalem. This is really bad. I don't think how a person or a government or a leader who believes in humanity and believes in the right to development would be complicit with what Israel is doing right now. But I must also refer to what Milantan said about uh, the biggest, uh, the three biggest supporters to Palestine, which is Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. I must say that maybe this is um, Qatar. Uh, I mean, sorry, Qatar, uh, from a governmental perspective. But I have to mention and give uh, attention to Kuwait, to Tunisia, to Morocco, to people in Egypt, in Lebanon. Everyone now is marching against the atrocities and war crimes committed by Israel in support of Palestinian people. And here as a Palestinian citizen and a Palestinian activist, I will speak on behalf of every single person who supports Palestine. I'm not here to represent government and I'm not here to talk on behalf of, of the government because the Palestinian cause is not about the governments and the Palestinian cause exists with or without the attention and the sympathy of the international community. And with what's happening right now, I must send a message to the international community and governments I cannot believe that what they're doing right now and how they promote peace with justice and uh, issue a United Nations resolutions and they're complicit with what's happening with regard to ethnic cleansing, unprecedented in our modern history. No one is doing ethnic cleansing right now, but it's taking place in Jerusalem. It's taking place against innocent people. I've never been involved in wishing death to a single Israeli. But my friends are threatened in their homes in Jerusalem and what's happening in Gaza now. Innocent people are being bombed and killed. News agencies like Al Jazeera, it was shelled yesterday. It's a news agency. Its role is to document what's happening and show the world. But now it's bombed and they cannot do that. So the international community must interfere. But if it's not, if it won't interfere, we won't stop. And I don't think that the Palestinian cause will be affected by that anymore because we are the ones who will create the change. And this revolution right now taking place, it's the revolution of people, not governments, nor the international community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. That was very strong. Thank you so very much. Um, this next question is again directed at all our speakers. Uh, I'd like to open the floor uh, with Ms. Lantern. The first part of this question is uh, technically for Ms. Noor and Yasmin. Um, as a generation that abhors violence, acknowledging the existence of crisis and your first-hand experiences and understanding of the conflict, how ethical have the two parties been in relation to international treaties and international domestic law of war? I'd like to start the conversation with Ms. Lanthan and work our way up to Ms. Noor and Yasmin. Okay, firstly, I am puzzled with the claim that 
we are a generation that somehow hates uh, violence. I don't see any evidence of that. I think every generation likes to believe that we are a special one. According to sentiment, we abhor violence, we reject it. But yes, it's happening and I won't deny that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really see it. There were plenty of people like us, even in generations before us, and plenty of people like the ones committing violence now in previous generations as well. In terms of the conduct, I would say, I mean, look, it's uh, very difficult to sort of make an argument that uh, any one side has abided by any kind of moral standard here, right? So, and uh, this is once again, the sort of the, uh, the interesting part of the total kind of different uh, narratives that the Israeli and the Palestinian uh, uh, sides have, right? So for example, even if we go into something like the, uh, the Nakba that was mentioned, right? The great catastrophe, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians by uh, the Jews. So the Jewish narrative is completely different. The Jews say, hey, go look at UN Resolution 181, right? So, what, so for your audience, so UN Resolution 181 is a United Nations resolution that was passed in 1947 by the UN General Assembly, which basically said that the Israelis and the Palestinians would live side by side with Jerusalem as a shared capital. So that was the solution put forward in 1947, right? Israel accepted that and the Palestinians rejected that. So the Israeli sort of version, now once again, I'm just kind of giving, adding context by sort of uh, uh, giving our audience some, some backdrop on what their version is, right? Yeah. So, so Israel's version is, look, we agreed to live side by side. You were the ones who rejected that. You are the ones who kind of uh, constantly reject our right to exist. You constantly reject our right to be a country and to live here. So that's one part in terms of the moral thing. And the other things that in relation to the present conflict, the, the kind of conduct of both sides of the present conflict, Israel is known for extremely disproportionate retaliation. So that will always have to be a part of the, the conversation that we have, right? The targeting of kind of uh, disproportion of targets, but using disproportionate attacks, okay? However, here, once again, and this is once again, the Palestinian leadership shooting itself in the foot. I remember there being so much sympathy when the uh, unrest first broke out and when the violence first broke out. And as usual, it's almost on cue, right? It's almost like uh, Israel's biggest asset always is the Palestinian leadership. Almost on cue, Hamas then starts firing rockets into Israeli territory. And that then becomes a piece that can be spun into propagandists on the other side of the political, of the political aisle. So it would be very difficult for either side to say that they have a moral stand here. And unfortunately, because the two of them have such completely divergent histories, two completely divergent versions of what exactly happened, it's once again, it almost, for people like us who are not insiders to the region, it almost becomes a, an impossible task for us to measure what moral pedestal there is, if, if at all there is. Thank you, Ms. Milan. I'd like to further this question to Ms. Yasmin and then Ms. Noor. Um, okay, so again, I want to highlight that we are not talking about two parties. We are yeah. talking about a colonizer and a colonized people, oppressors yeah. and oppressed. We are calling a, a, a nuclear um, state with heavy weapons and Palestinian people who are unarmed and well, Hamas had some rockets. So we are talking about the so, uh, imbalance of power. So we're talking about two parties just in neglects the, di the power dynamics within what's happening. We're not talking about two parts. We're not talking about two sides. And, um, and uh, referring to what my um, colleague just said, we're not um, about, about the notion of sympathy. It's not that we want the sympathy of the world. We want the world to recognize the ethnic cleansing and the colonialism and the apartheid that's taking place in Palestine. And it's not complicated. No, it's not complicated. It's just that simple. We are being ethnically cleansed in our own homeland and it's not complicated. And there's no contradiction and history and, history and facts can tell you 
how Palestinian people, like we're talking about half of the Palestinian population, what ethnic increased in 1948, and another 300,000 people were also ethnically cleansed in 1967. And we are still facing ethnic cleansing until today. So these are actual facts and it's not complicated. Um, so we are not, again, we're not talking about two parties. We are talking about Israel attacking Palestinians, oppressing Palestinians, ethnically cleansing us and having an apartheid regime from the river to the sea in historical Palestine. And Israel, as Noor just mentioned uh, very eloquently before, Israel is, um, Israel is um, violating international humanitarian law and international, every international law. Israel is, is violating international law with clear impunity and zero accountability from the international community. So what 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 I want to say is like when you are in your uh, when you are in your home or your home country and someone invades and wants to take half of it, would you agree? I don't think you would. And if they take take over your land, your water, your language, your food, your your family, um, you every aspect of your life is being colonized. Even your theology and my Bible is colonized, and you have to be silent and we have to agree with that to live with that i think that uh, expecting us to accept to live with apartheid is um well i don't have the word for that but asking us just to accept to live with apartheid is is too much i i, I don't have the right word to express how too much yes. is that no people are supposed to be accepting to these aristocracy, these violations. So, um, yeah, I will stop here. Thank you, Ms. Yagni. Ms. Noor, do you have anything to add to that? Sentence? Yes. <laughs> yes, I want to uh, say that our issue is not about diplomacy. diplomacy. And I, I am certain that Palestine and the Palestinian government, ha they have made a lot of compromises and historic compromises with Israel. For example, let me start with the Palestinian sides. They I wrote some notes. The Palestinian side accepted historic compromise, which is the so-called two-state solution. We've accepted this. We've been fighting for this for a long time ago. But the two-state solution is is actually dead right now. Why? Because we've accepted that the two-state uh, solution is based on the 1967 borders, but Israel did not comply with that. Israel constantly violated all of the agreements and all of the historic compromises that we've made and we've reached with them, including Oslo Accords. So I, uh, um, I must, it's very important to talk about the Oslo Accords with um, the main concept of the 1993 uh, Oslo Accords, which is called the Declaration of Principles and Ensuing Agreements between the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization and the Government of Israel, which uh, it's involved, it revolved around establishing a framework of transitional self-government arrangements for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip over a five-year period that would be followed no later than the third year by negotiations on a permanent solution. This did not happen. The two-state solution is dead right now, and it's no longer on the table. Why? Because of what's happening. The two-state solution, they said that, is Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. But let's go back a while ago with Trump and his declaration that Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. He violated historic agreements and resolutions, and he negated the existence of the Palestinian people by declaring Jerusalem as the capital of, of Israel. Right now, I think there's no time to go back to historic agreements and compromises, including Oslo and these things, because right now we must fight for our existence, including our national existence, which means Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine, not East Jerusalem, nor West, Jer uh, West Jerusalem, sorry, because the Israeli soldiers, where are they now? They are in East Jerusalem. They are in East Jerusalem trying to forcibly evacuate families from their homes in order to bring settlers who are illegal, by the way, to live in their homes. So 
yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that we, we did agree on a lot of things. We did make a lot of compromises. So I think now there's nothing to compromise anymore. People are literally dying and they're uh, all of the people in the streets because they have nothing to lose because we've been fighting for international agreements since, I don't know, more than 70 years right now. I would say more than 70 years, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Moon. Um, this next question is directed at Ms. Nanantan. Um, this morning, we heard about the bombing of the offices of Al Jazeera and Associated Press in an airstrike. Um, what sentiments do you hold on this in terms of international law and diplomatic silence on it? Okay, so in terms of international law, one thing has to be stated here quite ambivalently, right? So international law, I'm sorry to say, is quite useless. And the Israel-Palestine issue has always been a great example for why both the modern international system and the international system of law are useless because there are no real enforcement mechanisms against states that flout international law unless they are a kind of uh, poor country, defenseless country that has to fight with twigs, right? So the UN is very happy to intervene in uh, Liberia and East Timor and Burkina Faso and uh, uh, South Sudan and all that, where they know that geopolitically, the permanent members of the Security Council and the international community at large will not really it, it will not really ruffle anybody's feathers, right? But those are the only types of countries where we see the international community actually intervening in a meaningful sense. Now, as far as the uh, strikes on uh, the Al Jazeera office go, so the International Criminal Court has now said that they might take this matter up further. And I think that will be an interesting sort of uh, development in the legal world because we will finally see what exactly the International Criminal Court's uh, sort of standards are. So on the Palestinian side, of course, as you've heard, right, the narrative is on the targeting of civilians, the scale of destruction and all that. So on the Israeli side, what Israel say is that they have followed all the protocols that a nation has to reasonably follow. Once again, there is no reasonable test because it hasn't gone to the International Criminal Court. So Israel is saying, look, we followed everything that an international sort of uh, standard would require us to do. So when I asked an Israeli colleague this morning whether uh, he felt that uh, journalists can be killed in airstrikes, his immediate response, and this tells you a lot about what the conversations in Israel are like, right? So he immediately said, which journalist was killed? Who was killed? I, I mean, and he was right. No journalists were killed, according to the sort of the Israeli thing, as in uh, the building was given advance warning that the airstrikes were going to come. This is what, so in many neighborhoods, this is what Israel does. So I'm giving you the Israeli sort of uh, terms of engagement and what they like to consider the legal process. They then conducted what is called a double tap procedure, which is you drop sound bombs on these buildings to create a large amount of noise to warn people. So they say that they had informed the building in advance and they then conducted a double tap before that building was attacked, right? So that's the Israeli thing. Now we can come to the larger question of, regardless of what they said about you, do you have the right to bomb a media organization? And I would say conventionally, the answer would be no, right? Conventionally, I think what most of us would say is that common sense tells us that the answer would be no. My sense is that the Israelis are going to uh, cite uh, uh, propaganda laws, as in the Israelis are now going to, in my estimation, right? I have no confirmation of this, but this is what I'm pretty sure, this is the legal line of argument that's going to be taken, which is that they have the right to target propaganda arms, propaganda wings of the adversary. And they will, their stance will be that Al Jazeera is a propaganda wing of the sort of the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian movement. And it will then be up to a judge or a panel of judges in the International Criminal Court to decide on that. Because once again, the last time we had proper rules and regulations of international law was back after the end of the Second World War. And in 1977, there were minor additional protocols added to bring in non-state actors as well into the fold of international law. So on many of these things like human, what kind of advance notice do you have to give before you open fire? What kind of evidence do you need 
that fires coming from a civilian population before you have the legal authority to fire back, right? So Israel, for example, says, look, we have no choice but to bomb many of these civilian areas because Hamas fires rockets from those civilian areas. So if this, go to, if this goes to an international criminal court, the court will have to decide, okay, so how much evidence do you need before you can make that decision? What kind of forewarning do you need to give before you can do that? Does a media company fall under the sort of uh, the scope of a propaganda wing, because once again, we were discussing Qatar earlier and Qatar being the biggest supporter of the Palestinians. So the Israelis claim that Qatar sends about 30 million uh, worth of weapons, 30 million US dollars worth of weapons to uh, the Palestinians every month, right? The, the, this is what Israel claims. So Al Jazeera, as you know, is not only a Qatari news outlet, but that when it was actually formed, was specifically formed at that time as a as an almost kind of a public diplomacy wing of the Qatari government. That's the genesis of the Al Jazeera channel itself. So I am personally not in favor of what was done, right? But I think if the International Criminal Court finally, finally decides to do something and they finally decide to sort of uh, take up an issue that they should, many of these things will be resolved because then we will have clear cut rules from the International Criminal Court on how it should be how it should be done right on the legality aspect i just wanted to point out to one more thing as well which is that when it comes to holding israel guilty for flouting international law i personally feel that it would be a lot easier to do that if everybody across the board accepts un resolution 181 and i accept i completely agree that if you see it as apartheid, you have every right to resist that. If you see it as foreign occupation, you have every right to sort of uh, uh, feel that way, right? So I'm not here to sort of uh, uh, play sides here. I just feel that from a practical point of view, because even the earlier assertion that everybody is on board with the two-state solution, Israel claims that there's ambiguity there. Israel says that Hamas is not on board a two-state solution and that Hamas will not accept Israel's right to exist. So if everybody was on board a two-state solution, this could be brought to the negotiating table. But Israel claims, and even if you look at the 2017 Hamas charter, it certainly does not seem like Hamas is ready to accept Israel's right to exist because they say it's occupation, it's colonization. Why should I support an unfair occupation? Why should I support unfair colonizers who have been transplanted into my land by these uh, European uh, superpowers, right? So that is the major problem here. A two-state solution, I, I personally think, might still be the only, I mean, I don't think there is a way out of this nightmare, but the closest you can get will be something like a two-state solution. Now, it's very difficult to bring the two into the negotiating table unless Hamas does that. I, I rambled a bit too much, uh, even though this question was supposed to be about Al Jazeera. I apologize. That was a lot of info important information. Thank you so much, Mr. Nilantha. Um, this next question is directed at uh, Ms. Yasmin and Noor, but if you have anything to add to what Ms. Nilantha uh, put, uh, gave to all of us, I'm allowing you that as well. Um, Ms. Noor, Ms. Yasmin, do you have anything to say? Ms. Noor. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I actually have a lot of things to say. Okay. I'll, um, I'll just make it brief. Uh, there is no justification to what happened uh, in Gaza and the bombardment of Al Jazeera building. I don't think there is any justification with or without warning or with or without sound bombs. I think uh, this uh, sheds light on the freedom of the press and the freedom and the right to the freedom of speech, assembly, and the rights of all journalists to practice their jobs normally in or um, with or without wars. And another thing that uh, Nilan uh, referred to is the propaganda. So I just uh, feel um, I'm intrigued in talking about the propaganda in Israel. I think uh, the main purpose uh, to end the um, in, to end depicting the real and full image of what is happening in Gaza is to bomb the building of Al Jazeera. 
And this is part of their propaganda. Let's just focus about the Israeli propaganda, for example. What they're doing right now, they're literally writing posters and chanting death to Arabs. While people in Jerusalem, Palestinians in Jerusalem in, and everywhere, including in Ireland, the UK, the US, uh, Madrid, and ev everywhere, they're just holding posters saying free Palestine. So there's a huge difference um, in the narratives and in the intentions of, uh, of our people and uh, the Israelis. Um, another thing that I have to refer to, um, talking about the two-state solution. Uh, a while ago, we were supposed to have elections since 14 years. We didn't and we couldn't have elections because Israel did not allow elections in Jerusalem. So this is a very big problem that should be addressed. Like we tried, we want to have elections so we can, you know, renew uh, the governmental blood, uh, elect people who have energy and to try to, you know, present uh, the cause to the international community and have negotiations with the new uh, American president. But Israel did not, did not allow us to do that. And I, and I hate saying allow us because we must do that with or without their permission. But you, as you can see, during the time of the elections and working and campaigning and trying to form lists and join lists to actually create a good and positive change in Palestine, as I said, Jerusalemites, Palestinians in Jerusalem are not allowed to elect their own president, who is the new uh, president of the state of Palestine. So I think this uh, have impacted the, uh, this is one of the most recent things that impacted the two-state solution that was uh, proposed, but you know, is no longer an option. And, and one last thing about Hamas and being the biggest threat to Israel. Let's just try to explore uh, how many enemies Israel ha uh, have. For example, ha Hamas is a terrorist organization to Israel. They consider Hamas as a, uh, as a terrorist organization, okay? But before Hamas bombed any, uh, uh, sorry, be before Hamas um, uh, sorry, I'm just running up. Uh, before Hamas did anything in Israel or threw any rockets, Israeli soldiers, they uh, invaded Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is uh, one of the most, if not the most important Islamic uh, landmark and site to Muslims all around the world. They started, they started, they made people angry. Okay, I'm not saying that I support violence, but I say that as a Palestinian or as any, uh, as an activist, people are actually watching what is happening. And this is the biggest problem to Israel right now. Israel cannot hide or cover or justify what it's doing right now. I think this is the time because it's the fact that Israel bombed Al Jazeera means that they are trying so hard to cover uh, their atrocities, war crimes and genocide. And I think this should be addressed in the International Court of Justice and international criminal law, just like the wall, the uh, sorry, the, the hearing of the apartheid wall was presented at the International Court of Justice, but nothing happened. So we have to mention that we did a lot of efforts and initiatives in trying to, you know, um, document our cases and include the international community in it, including the apartheid wall, which is still, uh, it's, it's still in Palestine and must be dismantled. Thank you, Ms. Um, This next question is to you, Ms. Yasmin. Um, would you be able to give us an understanding of what life is like on the ground for the Palestinian citizens? Um, sure, I will just add to the description that Noah has just um, said. Um, first of all, we do not have a state and the two state solution is that um, I will just affirm that again because Palestine right now or what we call um, the West Bank and Gaza, these are two separate entities and the West Bank itself where I come from is now uh, surrounded all around by the Israeli apartheid wall. And inside the West Bank itself, there are 500,000 500, Israeli settlers who are living in settlements inside the West Bank itself, which is supposed to be the Palestinian state. 
Um, and uh, also following to the Oslo Accords, uh, the West Bank is divided into three areas, area A, B, and C, where Palestinians are not allowed to live basically uh, and use the lands of area C, which is 75% of the West Bank itself. So we are actually talking about um, small uh, open air prisons or ghettos inside the West Bank where Palestinians live. And all these Palestinian cities, um, which are, which are already divided by settlements, there are also lots of checkpoints. We are talking about, uh, we'll get the number, um, uh, I think there are over 99 uh, Israeli checkpoints throughout uh, the West Bank itself and separating Palestinian cities from themselves. So at any point, uh, at any Israeli checkpoint, especially the checkpoint connecting the north of the West Bank to the south of the West Bank, if they decide to close the checkpoint, they will be separating all of us from each other. They'll be totally separating the north from the south. And also, there are also the bypass roads inside the West Bank itself. And the bypass roads are basically the roads that are for settler use only, where us as Palestinians are not allowed to use, which is also um, evidence, if you still need more evidence for the apartheid regime that's being conducted by Israel. Uh, and also, as Anur mentioned, the wall, the wall is, I don't know if you can imagine the wall, the wall is like an eight meter concrete high wall that's surrounding all Palestinian cities inside the West Bank. So um, it's actually, and it's actually 85% of the wall is erected inside the West Bank and inside the Green Line. So it's actually taking in more land towards Israel and it's also taking in more water resources um, with it, within its route. It's separating families, it's separating communities, and it's actually illegal under international law, as Noor mentioned, with the um, inter with the 200 uh, with the 2004 um, uh, with the 2004 International Court of Justice um, rule. Um, it's illegal, and Israel and the International Court of Justice actually asked Israel to dismantle it and to stop building it. That was 2004, 16 years ago, and the wall is still being erected and maintained until today. Um, and also I have to talk again about the plight of, of the Palestinian <laughs> refugees who are scattered all around the world. And uh, this Palestinian diaspora is not being given the right to come back to Palestine, to historical Palestine. Um, but, but if you are if you are a Jew, basically, uh, or if you find in your album of pictures, a picture of your great grandmother wearing uh, a David star, and you can come to Israel and say that I wanna be an Israeli citizen, that you will be, you will be welcomed. But as Palestinians who lived in Palestine for thousands of years and are now scattered as refugees in Lebanon, if they try to come back to Palestine or historical Palestine, they will not be granted entry because they're only Palestinians. So again, we're talking about an apartheid system that, and the colonial system that's uprooting the indigenous Palestinian people of the land and replacing them with Israeli Jews. Um, um, and also, uh, yeah, I, I also have to mention that the settlements and the erection of settlements in Palestine is um, is illegal again, and it's it it is illegal under the Port Geneva Convention, where uh, Israel, as uh, an occupying power, is not uh, supposed to uh, is not supposed to erect settlements in the areas that it occupies, even in the West Bank. Um, I don't know, Noor, if you have anything to add right now, but I also want to mention again, stress again. Um, our limited freedom of movement inside the West Bank itself, which is supposed to be the, the so-called Palestinian state, we are being controlled in all directions. We cannot even travel without the permission of Israel, and we cannot come back to, to the West Bank itself without the permission of Israel. And like, for example, Noor lives in Jerusalem, or he's from Jerusalem and I'm from Bethlehem. We both have different ID cards as Palestinians, um, and we cannot, I cannot go to Jerusalem to see Noor unless I have an Israeli permission that allows me to go to Jerusalem. And even if, if I got the, the right documents and the, the right permission to go to Jerusalem, and I'll be crossing the checkpoint to go to Jerusalem from Bethlehem, sometimes they would just not allow me in because they can. So our 
I have to stress that all of our life details are um, conducted or are controlled by this Israeli occupation, this colonization. It's not, um, we're not talking about a mere theoretical idea. We are talking about our most detailed basic life, we're going to university, going to visit your family, um, um, having your water cut off, electricity cut off, like they, are, they have control over all aspects of our daily lives. It's not a theoretical thing. It's something that's affecting us in every single day and every single minute. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, Ms. Nuru, do you have anything to add uh, to what Ms. Yasmin said? <coughs> um, should I answer the same question that Yasmin answered? Or is it also addressed to me or no? Um, it does address you, but we have a short, a small issue with the timing because we have reached almost one hour and a, uh, one hour uh, and thirty minutes. Um, is if it's okay with you, can I move on to the next question? Um, yes, um, hoping that I would, I could answer part of this question in another. Uh, you know, you should be able to. Yes. Please. Yeah. All right. Um, this next question is again directed at you, Ms. Yasmin. Um, the conflict is framed as a Jewish-Arab conflict. What are the sentiments of the region's historic Christian community and other minorities living in Palestine? Um, so, it's, first of all, it's not a religious conflict. Um, it's framed it's, that way because that it's one, beneficial. Yeah. It's framed that way, but it's yeah. not religious. Um, it's not Jews versus Arabs. It's Israeli colonizers against Palestinian indigenous people. And these Palestinians come in all religions. We are Christians and Muslims and Jews. Um, and um, it's, as Palestinian Christians, I have to say, we have also suffered a lot from this notion. Uh, and we have seen our Bible being colonized and our, well, what we call the good news of the Bible being interpreted in ways that are becoming a threat to our existence in our own land as a whole Palestinians. So we not only suffer from the occupation itself and its apartheid regime we all, as Palestinians, we also suffer as Palestinian Christians from those wrong interpretations for some theologians. So. The, the word of God I would say the Bible became a source of destruction. It's, it's becoming weaponized against us as Palestinians. Um, so in, in the Karus Palestine document, we say that this use of the Bible to, leg to legitimize and support political options and ideologies and positions that are based on injustice. Um, and and, uh, and they are, um, supporting the imposition of one people or one person over another, it's transforming religion into a human ideology. And it's stripping the Bible, it's stripping the word of God from its holiness and from its universality and truth. It's making us think again and again and wonder if God loves us, if God sees us as Palestinian Christian. If our Bible is against us, then why are we born in Palestine? And um, and, and as Palestinian youth, we have witnessed that a lot. And we witnessed our land being confiscated and our family members imprisoned, our rights being liquidated, our water, culture, language, food, and everything stolen before our own eyes. And we were asked to be good Christians. And we were asked to accept God's promise. We were asked to accept that the Jewish people consider this land to be the promised land. and we should be silent and accept our own oppression. And I think, and I believe that this is a colonial theology. It's a theology that uh, requires us to give up our rights to be good Christians. And, but, but, but God should not be asking us to surrender our dignity and our independence and existence in our own land. And that's, that's why these are colonial beliefs. This is a colonial theology that is weaponizing our own Bible and justifying, justifying our own oppression. So um, I would like to say that this theology is disturbing the image of God and it's for us and it's disturbing our perception of ourselves and 
it stresses that we are not loved by God and we are just, you know, an afterthought to God. And we should also alienate ourselves from our land and that we do not belong here. That's why, that's why we, uh, as Palestinian Christians, we are in dire need, as many Palestinian theologians are working on, in dire need of a Palestinian theology that sees us as human beings that are um, that are worthy because God made us worthy, God created us worthy to live in our own land and we should preserve our dignity to live together with our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters in the land of Palestine. It's, we need the theology that would recognize the injustices that are befalling upon us and that does not support our oppression. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Um, this next question is directed at Mr. Nilantan. Um, Israel's justification for the attacks have always taken the form of a nation in defense. As a defense analyst, what is your opinion in this sentiment? They believe it to be completely true. That's my sense of it. Whether we as a neutral party see that to be true or not would always be dependent on the circumstances. So they've always framed it as their right to exist being threatened, which is why I was saying in, in, in Israel, it's very easy to kind of uh, uh, rile up uh, patriotic nationalist sentiments because of this existential threat. So even the Israeli national anthem has this very interesting line. Right. It says, as long as one Jewish heart still beats, this 2000 year dream will never die. Right. So it's a very emotional issue for them in terms of this being a sort of I mean, uh, uh, obviously, as uh, it's been stated before, it's actually a much more modern dream than that. Right. It might be a 2000 year old dream very vaguely, but as an actual Zionist experiment or Zionist project. It's uh, it's smaller, but but the narrative, the national narrative, is that it's a two thousand year dream, right? So ultimately, the way we break through that and the way we sort of circumvent that is by proving them wrong, right? But it's very difficult to prove them wrong until there is some kind of legal position taken, un parallelly, right, comprehensively recognizing their right to exist because it's it was ex, it was established in 1948 right so it's been more than 70 years now right so there have been about two generations and the third generation that's growing up now as israelis right so the current generation most i mean as in of course there are still immigrants coming from all over the world and all that but uh, their question is so if you are going to say that our very existence is a is a, is a kind of a foreign virus in your lands and that our very existence is some kind of uh, colonial interference in your land. So, I mean, these are the, these are these people are not going to go jump into the sea. Right. And at the same time, neither are they going to take up a pacifist position when they have the military power on their side. Right. So ultimately, the major tragedy of the Palestinians in the strategic game is that Israel's strategic power allows it to take up unreasonable positions if it wants to, because it has all the power or the sort of the Palestinians, on the other hand, they don't have the same amount of military power. So therefore, they do not have the same luxuries that Israel does. I, I'm not saying that's a fair system, right? Of course, it's unfair. Of course, it's unfair that Palestinians cannot afford to take up as irrational a position as the Israelis if they want to, right? But that is the power dynamic that we kind of need to uh, deal with here. So the existence of Israel will be a very major question in any legal defense that it puts up. So if Israel ever has to make an international legal defense, I highly doubt that's ever going to happen because of how, how useless I told you the international community and international law in general is. But this will be their foundational argument because they can go back to saying, look, from from right from 1947 legally we have been willing to coexist with you but you are not willing to coexist with us because you see our very existence as a virus you see our very existence as a colonial sort of endeavor here so we can't just go jump into the sea there are millions of us here and we need to stay now on the palestinian side once again i would say the biggest tragedy is the way in which 
they've lost all their friends and once again many of the arab countries point to their unwillingness to be flexible in their position now once again this is not to demean the emotions of palestinians who have to live under the circumstances that we just listened to right this is not to demean their anger this is not to say that their anger and their rage is not valid it's certainly it's certainly very very valid but we need to have some kind of resolution here at some point of time some breaking point will be arrived at and the sooner both sides kind of acknowledge this the better i feel but right now israel has the luxury of being irrational so the al jazeera attack right israel has the has the luxury of just bombing an al, al jazeera office and then claiming that they will get away with it scot free so the overall game and whether israel self defense uh, sort of argument holds up or not is completely dependent on the palestinian side can there be uniform acceptance that some kind of israeli state will exist if they say no a, a jewish state cannot exist and israel cannot exist then it, it's going to be near without a complete bloodbath or a complete genocide it's never going to be we are never going to be able to resolve that problem if that is the position thank you mr milan um, um. Can, can we add? Can, yes. Yeah, go Question. on. Note. Yeah. Question. No, oh. please. Okay. So I'm gonna uh, just uh, say a few things, and then Yasmin uh, can uh, continue. I just wanna tell uh, Minalton that since he's a defense analyst, and he's right now talking to two Palestinian uh, activists, uh, I think it would be a great idea if he also uh, sits with uh, some Israelis and talk about this. Uh, topic with them because um you know uh how israel defend uh, itself and it, it we we are not victimizing ourselves and i know that you acknowledge everything that we've said and you acknowledge the, our struggle and suffering i completely respect that but i don't think that uh palestine uh, with all due respect is waiting for a solution right now first as a palestinian and if i want to describe myself as an activist i wish no one death this is one thing i don't think that israel will ever uh, israeli people will uh, will ever throw themselves in the sea just to well save palestine and let all palestinians come back but there are a lot of issues that while talking about this and talking about you know their defense mechanisms we we must refer to palestine refugees my 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 concern and my issue is palestine it's not israel so when we talk about this we must talk about the uh, rightful owners of the land the palestinian refugees in syria in in jordan in uh, in lebanon they must have the right to compensation they must have the right to to their own properties this is one thing when we talk about the palestinian refugees okay and we um well propose a solution for them how can we negate the issue of palestinian refugees but constantly continue with the expansion of illegal settlements and the uh, the annexation uh, process of israel annexing lands confiscating lands and expanding settle illegal second settlements on the lands that belong to palestinians including in area a which was designated by israel and palestine a long time ago area a and area b and area c so i don't know how israel can defend itself with everything that sorry with everything that is happening but from a palestinian point of view there are a lot of things that we must talk about then talk about the solution if israel should leave or should not leave but right now i'm just fighting for my basic right of being existent like i exist i am palestinian and this is my national identity give me a passport that represents my country i was born in jerusalem and i don't have a palestinian passport i have an israeli travel document and a jordanian passport but i live in palestine i need something to represent me and then we'll talk about whether israel should uh, israeli should throw themselves in the sea or not Thank you, Ms. Nord. This next question is directed at Can you. Can I add yes. something yes. very yes. briefly, please? I just yes. want to highlight yes. that 
it's not about us expressing our emotions or expressing yeah. our anger. It's about our right to live, basically. It's about our basic human rights. It's our right to exist. It's not about, I, I understand you are giving us a platform to express ourselves, but it's not, we are not only here to express our anger or emotions. Yes, we are angry. Yes, we are very angry for what's happening and what happened and what continuing to happen every day. But it's not about our anger, it's about our existence. It's about our existence as a people, as human beings and our basic human rights. So the answer is not us giving, uh, giving more uh, compromises or giving our right to live basically in our own land would not solve the problem. I think we have to really make a connection with Israel with every imperial and colonial entity around the world. Israel is not separated from this global structure. What's happening in Colombia and what's happening, well, in, I, I, I don't want to start naming places, but what's happening around the world is totally connected. We are the, the the colonization of indigenous people like what happened in the us and canada and australia and all over the world it's all interconnected we cannot or the world cannot ask us ask us to give up our right to live in our own land to make peace what kind of peace comes from building a state on the bodies of dead people thank you thank you Ms. Yassi. Um, this next question is also directed to you, Ms. Noor and Ms. Yasmin. Um, in Sri Lanka, we find occasionally that Islamophobia plays into the personal positions that individuals take in their conflicts. With your academic backgrounds, how has uh, global sentiments of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism played into the narrative? And how has this conflict exasperated both, uh, both those forms of racism? Um, can we start with Ms. Noor? Thank you. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so I'm just going to focus on a certain uh, uh, idea and then Yasmin can uh, complement what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, uh, as Yasmin said in a previous uh, question, that this is not a religious uh, conflict. This is one thing. But the problem uh, with uh, Israel is that it con constantly accuses any peaceful movement or anything that it opposes as anti-Semitic. Anti For example, uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanction, the BDS, it never uh, encouraged any violent action. It was constantly uh, calling for the boycott of academic and cultural events in Israel, or that supports Israel because they are complicit in the war crimes that are perpetrated by Israel. So uh, this affected the conflict as a Palestinian uh, citizen, as an ordinary citizen. It affected me because if I want to talk about the BDS or if I want to talk about, uh, if I want to go and uh, participate in a peaceful uh, protest, I am accused uh, of anti-Semitism. And I don't think this is related to, uh, to anti-Semitism. I believe that I respect all Jews. And I believe in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And I think that this is not a matter of anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. And I think we should just get over this, uh, just uh, these justifications and excuses because Jews themselves are being pro-Palestinians. There are a lot of Jews who are members of the BDS and other peaceful movements, and they believe in their religion and they practice their religion on a daily basis. Of course, Islamophobia, I think it fed and it actually exacerbated the situation because, because of the different interpretations uh, of uh, Islam and uh, everything that happened in the world, including the uh, you know, ISIS attacks and referring to them as Islamophobia. But I don't think that it's as relevant to the Palestinian cause uh, as it is to other uh, situations or wars or conflicts because Jerusalem, for example, is the city of the three monotheistic religions and we uh, we respect Jews, we have the, uh, the Jewish friends and it will never be a problem of religion to us. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Yasmin, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I'll what? be very brief. I'll just highlight that anti-Semitism is not anti-Zionism, and there is a difference between being anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. 
And I also want to add that as Arabs, we are also Semites. Like we cannot be anti ourselves, we cannot be anti Semitic because we are Arabs and we are Semite ourselves. So I want to highlight this notion. Thank you, Ms. And just to say, uh, like last sentence, our issue again is not about religion, it's with the ideologies, the Zionism, the ideology of Zionism is the problem. Thank you, Ms. Nair. This next question is again directed at both of you. As activists, what is your individual cause and what drives you to communicate your cause to the world? I know this has been phrased before, but we'd like uh, for you to give it to us briefly with more clarity. And what tangible action do you expect from the global population to support your cause? Uh, Ms. Noor, you can start it off. <clears throat> yeah, um, my, my answer is very relevant to what I'm currently doing, studying public advocacy and activism. So right now my focus is on studying the theories and uh, the theories and the principles of advocacy and activism in order to come back to Palestine. I'm now in Palestine, but I'm going back to Ireland uh, to actually um, promote for uh, peace through adv uh, advocacy, through campaigns. So my main role right now is to educate every single person about my life, about my identity coming from uh, Palestine, living under occupation, being constantly threatened of uh, losing my identity or losing a beloved one, including uh, besides uh, the loss of my father. So right now I'm just focusing on uh, receiving good education so I can contribute to Palestine, first and foremost through education, through words, through talking and implementing everything that I study and everything I learn on the ground by communicating with people from different nationalities, building a network of activists and advocates who believe in justice, equality, freedom, dignity, and self-determination and sovereignty. And after that, I, I, I see that there is still hope in uh, freeing Palestine and in seeing visiting Yasmin in Bethlehem without having to pass through a checkpoint. Both of, I see that I'm, everything that I'm doing right now is to, is to stay alive and see the day where I hold a Palestinian identity and travel through my own airport that exists in Palestine and truly feel like I am a human being, just like how I feel when I'm in Ireland. I want people to focus on trauma, to focus on the mental health of Palestinians. People in Gaza, including my friends, have not yet healed from the post-traumatic stress caused by the, war, the, the, the last war on Gaza, and now they're being yet again traumatized. We need to focus on that, and as activists, it's very important to focus on that. So whoever is watching me right now, I would just like to direct a simple um, suggestion, we must also focus on the importance of mental health and end the stigmatization of it, especially to Palestinians and everyone who is currently living under wars because it's equally important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Noor. Um, Ms. Yasmin? Um, yeah, I have to stress again that I believe that as indigenous people, our struggle for freedom is transnational. And um, well, no one will be free until we are all free. Um, so what I would ask from, well, the from the global community or from people who are uh, interested in knowing what they can do for the Palestinians, um, I, would say, I would say first that we need to actively uh, advocate for decolonizing Palestine, because again, our fight for justice is transnational and well, when we are, when no one will be free until we are all free, and I would also ask that I would also ask people to stop funding companies and corporations that are complicit and profiting from apartheid and well human rights violations that are happening in Palestine. So to actively support uh, the boycott of uh, the boycott of Israel, and also I want to stress that if you stand against colonization, apartheid occupation and ethnic cleansing of any people, then you should probably stop funding it. 
Um, and I would also ask people to drop the both sides narrative. Their narrative, again, disregards the power dynamics. It, portray, it portrays the image of equal parts, but we are not, again, we are not equal parts. We are talking about unarmed, well, uh, un unarmed uh, protesters and unarmed Palestinian people against a nuclear weapon, a nu nuclear state. So we are not talking about equal parts. And I would also ask people to use the right terminology and to call things what they are really, to call things with their actual, actual names. Again, it's not a conflict, it's ethnic cleansing. And Israel is a settler colony. It, it's a settler colony that enforces a structure of apartheid in historical Palestine from the river to the sea. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yadis. <laughs> this next question is directed to all three panelists. Um, we'll start the conversation with uh, your response, Ms. Yasmin. Um, diplomatic problem solving has not been something that people are accustomed to hearing when speaking about Israeli-Palestinian crisis or slash ethnic cleansing. Um, what thoughts can you share with our viewers regarding the negligence and inconsistencies of government and authorities on either party with regards to conflict resolution? We'll start this off with Ms. Yasmin, Ms. Noor, and then Ms. Tanila. Um. Again, I would stress that it's not conflict resolution that we need right now. We are talking about decolonization. We are talking about making Palestine free from the apartheid system. Um, so um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to tackle the negligence and inconsistency of governmental authorities. We already have tackled that, but, but I think decolonization comes from the people and when, when the people want to stand up with each other and rise to protect each other as people, we can, uh, we can make change happen. I'll stop here. Ms. Noor? I'm just, uh, well, yeah, I agree with Yasmin. I think we've covered a lot of uh, these things, but I would just say that we must reject and justify the uh, misperception that a political settlement is what will give the Palestinian people a state, and that Israel will be the one to grant us the state. This, uh, I must highlight this. And um, this thinking contradicts history, uh, facts, law, and reality, and must cease to be appeased. As with our right to self-determination, the existence of our state is not contingent on the peace process. It is an innate historic right of the Palestinian people that can neither be vetoed nor negated by Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next question, um, Ms. Lanta. Yes. So yeah, what was the question again? Could you please uh, I yes, just got uh, rephrase it? Um, diplomatic problem solving has not been something that people are accustomed to hearing when speaking about the Palestinian crisis slash conflict resolution, um, sorry, slash ethnic cleansing, apologies. What thoughts can you share with our viewers regarding the negligence and inconsistencies of government and authorities on either party with regards to this conflict, uh, with regards to conflict resolution slash um, emancipating ethnic cleansing and colonization? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've already uh, uh, discussed uh, 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 yeah, a lot on that front. The one thing I will say, so one recent thing uh, that uh, once again, uh, once again, I guess uh, I'm going to have to kind of take the Israeli side, right? But, uh, but I might as well go all the way. So uh, one major thing. So if you look at the, uh, once again, the narrative that this is kind of a nuclear power versus unarmed protesters. That's certainly kind of the valid paradigm through which we need to look at the protests, right? So, but on the other hand, however, we also have to deal with the, if this ever goes to court, uh, we also have to deal with uh, sort of uh, thousands of rockets coming into Israeli I think we lost Ms. Nilantan. Um, technical committee. All right. Um, okay. Um, we've come down to our last three questions. I think there's been some kind of uh, technical difficulty um, related to Ms. Nilant, and we'll just move on. And if he find, if he can restore his connection, he'll join us once again. Um, 
if you can prescribe a solution to the current state of affairs, what would it be and what? This is our final question for the both of you. Uh, I think I already mentioned that decolonization is the answer when we can stop some one people from colonizing and ethnically cleansing another people, then that's the solution. So it's decolonization in brief. Ms. Noor. <clears throat> I think uh, I agree with uh, Yasmin. And I also uh, say that the, the solution right now is also to hold Israel accountable because by failing to hold Israel accountable, uh, we are uh, allowing, uh, we are providing Israel with billions and billions of dollars uh, to kill innocent people. And we are allowing Israel uh, to get away with murder and that the mobs of racist settlers uh, uh, can enjoy impunity in attacking and harassing innocent citizens. So um, if the international community won't hold Israel accountable, Palestinians, by their existence, we are right now holding Israel accountable for every war crime and genocide and atrocity it is committing right now against Palestinians, whether in Jerusalem, Gaza, Led, Ramle, Haifa, Akka, and everywhere, including in refugees camp in Syria, uh, in, in, in exile, Palestinians in exile. Thank you, Ms. Noor. Thank you, Ms. Yasmin. Um, as an organizing committee, we have one final request from both of you. Um, Sri Lanka is a small country that is miles away from the horrific catastrophe taking place in the Middle East. But we have active youth in this country who have the ability to communicate, who have the ability to support this cause. What should we do? How can we contribute? How can we make the lives of the Palestinian people easier? Um, I would just say that we are all believers of humanity and we all uh, want to uh, enjoy every provision in the international humanitarian law because we are all human beings and we should be treated with dignity and justice and uh, must be safe enough to live our lives. So whether uh, you um, in Sri Lanka, uh, miles away, or in, uh, in China or in Europe or in an Arab country, we must always fight violence and terrorism. And we must always be updated with what is happening with the world. As a Palestinian, I'm not only focused on what's happening to me and to my country, because everything that happens in the world, if in South Africa or in Sri Lanka or anywhere, it affects me. And a great example of that and a great reminder is the global pandemic of COVID-19. It taught us that we all have the same struggle in combating the, uh, the pandemic. And we all want to be safe from the virus and get uh, uh, um, vaccinated, right? It affects all of us. A pandemic affected all of us. So I think this is a lesson for all of us to learn that everything is interconnected and that we live in one uh, world. So we should all help each other, support each other and promote uh, freedom and independence to the Palestinian people and stay educated. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would only add that um, to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and every other oppressed people around the world, I would ask now for the people who are uh, following us, maybe they can write for the political leaders in support of the case of Palestine, they can put pressure on the government, they can also uh, put pressure on your own government to put pressure on Israel to stop its violations of human rights and to hold Israel accountable. And also I would ask for a boycott for uh, Israeli companies that are complicit in the apartheid and the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and to show your solidarity for the Palestinian people and to keep, keep learning and to keep teaching about the cause of Palestine and every other oppressed people around the world. And, and thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Yasmin and Ms. Noor. Um, um, the organizing committee has informed me uh, to wait a couple of minutes uh, to see if we are able to connect with Mr. Delantan again, because 
Um, he was also a part of our conversation. Um, till, uh, till, if till, till he comes back, um, we're going to answer a question uh, presented to us by our audience members who are viewing um, our conversation. Uh, the question presented to us is from, uh, um, I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly, um, Khadija Mariam. Um, he says, uh, pro-Israelis have repeatedly brought in the argument that Jews were constantly kicked out of the region under the different regimes that conquered it, uh, which is their home from the time it was declared uh, the holy land for them. Because of this, they claim that the Jews have the right to create a state in their homeland and that we cannot deny them that because they were there from before, how do you respond to this? If you can keep it brief and respond to this question, uh, whomever believes they have the answer to the question, Ms. Nur Ms. Yasmin. Um, so, again, um... I'm not gonna go into the theological part of this question because it will take me a long time to go into the theological part of this question, but for the humanitarian part of this question and the political part of this question, I would say if Jews believe that they have the right to live in historical Palestine, does that have to be on the expense and over the dead bodies of Palestinians? Thank you, Ms. Yasmin. Um, we're going to ask answer one more question, and if Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Nilantan does not make it back, we'll end our session. Uh, this question was presented to us by Binuri Gunabardana. Um, is there any hope for reconciliation given the history that uh, what might be the ultimate outcome uh, if Palestine agrees to back down? Let me rephrase. Is there any hope for reconciliation given the history? and what might be the ultimate outcome if Palestine agrees to back down. This is how she has framed, uh, phrased the question. Ms. Noor. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I really don't understand the question, but I yes. kind of get the sense that uh, she is asking what, uh, what do I think if Palestine backs down which means retreat, uh, retreats from what is yeah. happening. And I don't think this is a valid question, honestly, because you're uh, asking the oppressor, what are you gonna do? And I, will you accept to, be, to stay oppressed? I will say no, I'm not gonna back down and I'm not gonna retreat and I will continue to fight for my right. I think Israel is, must seize its uh, constant and consistent violations against Palestinians and uh, until then, we, uh, I don't know, until we get our freedom back and our independence, until I can be able to visit my family and friends and every, my neighbors in Gaza, then we'll talk about retreating. But now there's no choice. We're, it's not about giving up or you know, backing down. This is not the issue now. You're asking an oppressor uh, uh, to accept uh, her reality as, as an oppressor as an occupied citizen of Palestine. I don't have an answer for that, to be honest. I think this question must be addressed to Israel and Israeli you know, activists. Thank you, Ms. Nur. Thank you, Ms. Yasmin. I want to thank you personally for taking time out of your lives, uh, for being with us this evening, communicating all of this, a lot of information that we can use um, to correct our perspectives. Um, uh, my, the technical committee is telling us that Mr. Ruthen is joining us shortly. Mr. Ruthen. All right, I'm just going to end the session. To all the viewers who tuned in, um, the conversation we had today unraveled a lot of information for all of us. Um, speaking as a Sri Lankan citizen, uh, yes, what we can do in our, in our capacity and our potential is quite limited, but it's not that we can't do anything. Um, there is a lot of room for change 
And though the legal framework does not support the innocent people who are colonized, who are being cleansed, who are being, who don't even have the rights to live, we have the responsibility to make sure that we voice their concerns and make sure that we can create a global platform where their concerns are, vocal, are made vocal and we are able to fight back. Ms. Noor, Ms. Yasmin, once again, thank you so very much for joining us this evening. Uh, I want to personally ask you to please share this conversation with your friends and family as well so that we can get this message across. We can have proper communication, more discourse. Thank you so very much for taking time out of your lives to be with us this evening. Uh, thank you to all the viewers who will be tuning, who tuned in live and who will be watching this recording later on Facebook. Um, this wouldn't be possible if not for the efforts of the organizing committee of the Rotary Club of Colombo East. So shout out to all of you uh, for noticing how important this conversation is given the time period and given the things that are happening around us. Um, thank you and good night, everyone. Thanks a lot for having us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.